their feet hit the ground in the morning and they wake up excited. They have been training for this day, not days, not weeks, months, or even years for this day. They get up, get their gear on, meet up with their friends. It's a cool, breezy day. They're pumped up. They have their caffeine in them, their pre-workout, and they are ready to go. They get in the car. They drive one, two, three hours to get to 436 Apple Harvest Drive, Glengarry, West Virginia. When they get there, car after car, it's backed up. People are directing traffic to the left, to the right. They park, and they're finally there. They are pumped. They're excited. They open the car door, and their feet hit the ground. What they don't know is when they hit that dirt, they are stepping on the ashes of David and Mackie Hutzler's trailer, their home. They're even stepping on David and Mackie's ashes, period, and they have no idea. The brutal and senseless murders of nine-year-old Mackie and his 56-year-old father, David Hutzler, what happened on January 6, 2012. But the planning for this event would have easily taken a year or longer. This event would go on to repeat itself one more time that year. And then the following year, the same thing would happen. That the mood was going to turn from happy and excited and motivated to just dreadful. One of those people that were so excited that day, they wouldn't leave alive. Before we move into anything else, I have an upsetting announcement to make. You guys will remember in the last video, I talked about Detective Corey Maynard, Sergeant Corey Maynard, that really helped this case along, got that verdict changed, helped Kelly a long way throughout this process. And unfortunately, he was killed in the line of duty on June 2nd, 2023. A uh, very senseless killing. Thankfully, the suspect has been caught, but the world lost a really, really good person, a really good detective, and again, just senseless and, and uncalled for. He was only 38. He was taken way too soon. So my thoughts and condolences go out to their family, their friends, any and everyone that Corey Maynard has touched. The couple's starting a family. Their two young children now left without their father will be remembered for far more than just the uniform he proudly put on each day. He was good. He was a kind soul. So he's going to be remembered for a lot of things, you know, being a state trooper, watching out for people and helping everyone he could. And he's also going to be remembered as a brother and a, and a son and a father and a husband. A written statement from Maynard's family says, In life, Corey was a wonderful dad and proudly and courageously served the state of West Virginia as a state trooper. Now, in death, he has continued that heroic legacy, making a far greater contribution to this world than most of us could ever hope to ourselves. As a tissue donor, he will save and heal the lives of many others. While we miss him every day, we also find comfort and strength in knowing that he lives on. Hey guys, welcome back. Thank you so much for sticking through this case with me. This is video three of the David and Mackie Hutzler murder files. So if you have not watched videos one and two, they're going to be linked directly below. You need to watch those first so you're all caught up. So we've had a lot of new subscribers, which is awesome. I just ask that you guys please continue to like and share. Also comment. All those things help get the story out there. And as many of you know, with this story, there's just so little coverage that there's really not much else to actually share and put out there. So the more you help with that, the more you help the case. So today we have a lot to unpack. 
have to put a trigger warning on this again. Today's going to be heavy. Use your own judgment. Quick reminder that everything in this video is alleged unless I tell you otherwise. These are just statements, information, things like that that I've collected from people close to the case or people who knew David and Mackie or just general comments. Do your own research, form your own opinion on everything. At the end of this one, guys, I'm going to have some mini cases for you that are local to the Berkeley County, West Virginia area. Please watch those. You may be able to help with those cases. Thank you guys for your patience and me getting this out there. This video took a little bit longer to produce than I thought it would. But in turn, this video is also going to be longer than the other ones. So make sure you have the time to watch the entire video. With all that being said, let's get close into it unravel this case and see what we can pull out. This is the David and Mackie Hutzler Murder Files, part three. So I'm just gonna do a brief recap of what we've talked about in video one and two and where we are right now. So we've established that nine-year-old Mackie and his father, 56-year-old David Hutzler, were shot and set on fire in their home, and for one year it was ruled a murder-suicide with no weapon and absolutely no soot in David's esophagus or lungs. The first detective that investigated this would be fired only months later for fraud and pled guilty to that. Detective Corey Maynard would take over the case, and while he did so, he did investigate. We were able to get that verdict changed from murder-suicide to double homicide, as it should have been. Detectives on the case fumbled the ball several times. You guys will remember Detective 9 is now on the case right now. And we have talked about so much missing evidence. Uh, again, we don't have a gun. Supposedly polygraph tests were taken from a couple people, and yet there's no reports of that. You know, the original file supposedly had only four pages when it was handed to Detective Brand, the first detective, to Detective Maynard, the second detective. So everything here, the, the ball was just totally dropped. You can't, you can't deny that. And right now it kind of seems like the case is at a standstill. Detective Nine has flat out said he doesn't have any more leads. We know that throughout this, David has been receiving threats. He was receiving threats from Rusa because he was a sovereign citizen. The group that he was in, he did not approve of the things that they were doing. He was supposedly calling them out, as, as what his friend Annie says. And he was receiving threats from them. On top of that, he was receiving threats from a nephew. David was supposed to move to Mississippi with his son. And that did not happen because their lives were cut short. So let's first talk about the threats that David was receiving from this group, RUSA. RUSA was a sovereign citizen group, so basically a lot of their beliefs are that the government is corrupt, they want to build a new government, we have too many amendments, too many taxes, too many things that are imposed on people. Now, at the time, and I don't have a lot of information on this, honestly, but at the time, David had moved from the group Rusa to a group called Vandalia Solutions. He divorced himself from Rusa and a man named Turner, the president of that group. So apparently Turner was not happy with David as David was exposing, exposing Rusa. Now, what that means, I'm not quite sure. So what I learned about Turner is that he did end up getting arrested. Basically, the case against him was that he was teaching classes on how to defraud the United States. He was convicted of actually sending a $300 million bond in his own name and aiding and abetting in sending 15 other fictitious bonds to the Treasury Department to pay taxes and other debts. So we have a man who has been sentenced to 18 years in prison, and that happened in 2013. So there's Quite the possibility that that's something that maybe David knew, was looking into, was calling him out on. And that is the reason why David then began to receive threats. Now, if you guys remember, his friend Annie also talked about receiving threats. She felt the same way David did, that the group was, there was something going on. There was something wrong there. And they both received threats from 
Turner and his group. So now that we're on the topic of Rusa, I have to bring up something that I came across. Uh, if you do any type of uh, Google search or anything like that, looking for David and Mackie Hutzler and their murder, you're only going to get about five or six articles, if that. But there's one particular one that comes up and it usually pops up as number two or number three. And this article is affiliated with Hate Watch, which I feel is just very ironic. And, and this article is like journalism 101 as to what you don't do. So this article dates that some of his last postings seemed paranoid that he had delusions because he believed in these, some of these conspiracies and some of these anti-government beliefs. But at the very end, it says, sadly, in all probability, the only danger he really faced were the federal boogeymen all in his head. Considering the fact he actually had two different parties actually threatening him and then to read this article granted i know it was written one month after his death disgustingly it was written one month after his death at the time this was a murder suicide this was not labeled a double homicide still the disrespect that's in here towards david you're basically stating that he went off the deep end um Yet you, you mentioned nothing else about what's going on in his life. So you just base it on what he's posting on the internet. I just, I find this article extremely disrespectful. You know, it's just bad enough that there's very little coverage about this to begin with. There are still people out there who strongly believe that this was a murder-suicide because there's been so little coverage on the fact that this has been changed to double homicide. And one of the top things that's recommended, one of the top articles that's recommended is this bullshit right here. So now it's time to get into the family and the conflict that was happening between David and who we call Chapter 8, who is David's nephew and would have been Mackie's cousin. What's going on that drives this conflict? What started it? And why did it continue? And why did it heat up right before David's death? He, uh, on a couple of occasions, had stressed fear or anxiousness or unnerving regarding a nephew. Animosities or anger or hate towards him and was making threats. And I know on two occasions when I was on the phone with Dave that the nephew had showed up and one time in particular he had me be real quiet we didn't want the nephew to even know that he was home we could hear in his voice that he was extremely nervous he made comments about possibly having to defend himself on that call um the other time he didn't hear pull up and he had opened the door and there was elevated voices. Not to where I could really understand, but I got enough of the tone to know that David did not want him there under any circumstances and that he was to leave and that he's not going to put up with whatever it was. You look at their personalities, it completely makes sense. Chapter 8 has been in the military. He's a member of the NRA. He's been described as being very arrogant. And, you know, you look at David and David is the opposite. He's never served. He certainly has his anti-government beliefs. He is more of a lover and a protector. And they're just total opposites, basically. So it's, it's no question that they wouldn't get along generally. But the overall thing that I have heard so far that really caused this big rift in, in this relationship is that at some point, David had went to Florida. And David was living in a cabin that was on his mom and dad's property. And he'd been living there for a while. They had, there hadn't been any issues. And then 
there became this conflict between chapter eight and David. So David goes to Florida and supposedly when he got back, all of his furniture, all of his belongings had been thrown out of the cabin and chapter eight was throwing him out. So this is, again, just a theory. I don't know for sure that this happened, but this is supposedly the cause of all the tension between the two. This is all in a very, very small area. And I say that because it's important to know that the Hutzler property is back to back. And, you know, with these two people being the way that they are, it's just not a good idea for anyone. What is now happening at the end of 2011 and 2012 is that this conflict gets really heated again. And supposedly that was because chapter eight was involved in a project, basically building a gun range. And supposedly David's land, the back piece of the property prevented the gun range to be set up in the way that chapter eight wanted. He wants to create this 1000 yard shooting range, which apparently are extremely rare. Couldn't see that any other range in West Virginia around that area even around in Virginia or Maryland have that type of gun range. So I think that one, that was kind of like a selling point for him, but because there would have been ricochet that went on to David's land, that was a huge issue of setting up this business. I'm not sure if chapter eight wanted to buy that back property or if he just wanted it to be given to him, but rumors were that David was absolutely refusing to have any part of him after the way he kicked him out of that cabin. Another thought I had is he was trying to convince David to participate in that event that I told you about in the very beginning. Throughout the next section, I know it will seem like we're getting off topic, but there are points to be made that are very much related when we look at David and Mackie's murder. So just hang in with me and you'll see how things tie together. So chapter eight had signed a contract with Tough Mudder. So the Tough Mudder event is extremely intense. I think it's been labeled as the most intense obstacle event in the U.S. It was big in 2012 and it just keeps growing. I know back in 2012, General Mills was a sponsor. And of course, that's a huge company. Right here is a list of the sponsors in 2022, just to give you an idea of just how big this is. If you're willing to put in time into that and have these events on your property, it will bring hundreds of thousands of dollars to not only the person holding the event, but also to the county. In 2012, the trailer was quickly demolished and the land was torn up because, you know, with these obstacle courses, that's what you have to do. You have to tear the land up. That's just part of it. At the very first Tough Mudder in April of 2013, an Ellicott City man, Avishek Sengupta, was known as Avi. He dove into water as part of one of the events, and he did not come back up. And the participants in this event were really relentless when it came to the seeming lack of urgency in this situation. Oh, shit, they're going in for somebody's drowning. Somebody's drowning. His friend, Deontay Wilkinson, started panicking on the platform because he realized that Avi had not resurfaced. Dude, get your mask about on, About two minutes passed between the time that Avi jumped and when the lifeguards finally oh, ordered like the rescue diver Mask on, go down there! When the rescue diver got into the water, he didn't have his tank on. And there were other participants on shore who were yelling at the lifeguard the entire time, yelling at him to get in the water. Witnesses reported slow responses from safety officials and the on-site rescue diver. Actual amount of time that Avi was underwater remains unclear, though based on the video footage alone, it's clear that he was underwater for at least eight and a half minutes. So Avi's mother would go on to sue the gun range General Mills as well, who was sponsoring Tough Mudder and Tough Mudder. At some point during this lawsuit, Avi's team would request that they could hold the court at Marshall County instead of Berkeley County because in Berkeley County, Peacemaker is a huge part of the community and it's bringing all this money to these businesses. 
And of course, while the Tough Mudder is running, all these sales are coming in, local businesses from restaurants, from lodging. There's obviously a a lot of networking that's going on here. And they felt like they were not going to get a fair trial. And I think that's valid. However, they would lose that argument. Eventually in 2016, they would make a settlement. And they settled out of court. I'm not sure what the amount was. It was not disclosed. It's just sad. It's, it's something that shouldn't have happened. And so sad for the friends and family of Avi. I was really taken aback that even after the settlement, there was not any type of apology or acknowledgement made from any of the defendants. As far as what I could see, there was no statement made by anyone, uh, not by General Mills, not by Tough Mudder, and not by Chapter 8. It didn't seem like any of those parties even acknowledged that a life was lost. This land took another person. So we know right after this was labeled a homicide, Detective Corey Maynard reached out in the paper trying to get people to talk about it and see if anyone would come forward with information. Corey Maynard would also put up a table at one of those Tough Mudder events after it was announced double homicide. And he would try to raise money and awareness to put forward towards a reward, a reward to get more information to try to solve this case. Chapter eight wanted nothing to do with that. He participated in no way whatsoever. From what I'm told from family, at the funeral, at David's funeral, chapter eight was over the top with his antics, just very dramatic about his sadness. So a recap, chapter eight has no problem demolishing the trailer and the property isn't his. A year later, he has no problem tearing it up for Tough Mudder event. And again, he does not have rights to this property. And when the Tough Mudder is running, the detective, the lead detective, is trying to raise awareness, collect more money for a reward fund, and you want nothing to do with it? I think these things say a lot about a person's character. The actions here just aren't adding up. Maynard wanted the account set up so Maynard could do the footwork out there to raise the reward, which he was aiming for 125000 And he said, one, one, like he never even asked him to set up the account. Chapter 8 is the one that got everything off that was on the land. Took everything that was worth anything. Chapter 8 was the first one to talk to the newscast. Chapter 8 the one that demolished the trailer and buried the remains under the ground. Chapter 8 the one that ran events on my daddy's land as hundreds of people walked over where daddy and Mackie passed away. So we're kind of seeing the type of person that Chapter 8 is through all these actions that he has had. But even with David dead, there would still be conflict over the property. So you can see in this article right here that the announcement is Berkeley County Tough Mudder would be ending in 2015, cutting their three-year contract short. Now, according to this article, the reason is because the Tough Mudder likes to rotate their events. However, that makes no sense because they would never sign a three-year contract to begin with if they knew they wanted to rotate their events. According to Kelly, what really happened is Kelly stepped in. Remember, Kelly is in Jersey. She is coming back and forth, but she's actually living in New Jersey and she's dealing with a lot when she is there. She eventually hears of the Tough Mudders being put on that land, the land that should be hers, and she intervenes. She hears about Avi's death and is scared to be sued because this technically was her property. And all this income and profit is coming in and she's not a part of it. The offer to pay her was never brought up. She intervened. She wanted it to stop and she was taking control of her dad's land. It would make no sense for an event that is bringing in so much income and so much profit to the area business in Glengarry and around that area is booming. 
with this event. They are making profit. So why would they ever opt out of running Tough Mudder again the third year? I mean, they didn't stop after the death. The reason it ended is because I came down from New Jersey. I went there the, the day before their last event that they had. That's when I went. They wouldn't shut it down. That's when I went to the state police. And with that, that's when had the sheriffs come serve me trespassing papers. And then they continued on with the event the next day. And the reason he put the no trespassing papers on me is because he didn't want me coming up there ruining anything and running my mouth. But they closed down because the property, they didn't have enough property to have the events on just his property alone. He needed daddy's property to do it. And because I showed cause that it was my property, then that's why they couldn't proceed on. So why is this important? Well, basically it tells us that David's land was needed in order to hold these events. It also tells us that he has no problem putting a no trespass on his own cousin, who technically should have had rights to that land, and that he is going to fight her for the land. That land is very important to him. This is the point where Chapter 8 starts to lose control. He's losing control of that land, and as far as his business goes, he just lost two events worth of income from not being able to hold the Tough Mudder in 2015. So let me back up briefly to 2001. Now in 2001, when David's dad died, there was a tax, a $1 million tax that was imposed on the family because of the land. Well, apparently David's grandfather kind of prepared for that. From what I can tell, were able to pay it off. However, after that, they didn't have much. Every grandchild, which there are nine of them total, Every grandchild, except for her, was given rights to some of the property. The Hutzlers own a lot of land. We're talking about thousands of acres. Kelly was somehow left out of the will. And the reasoning supposedly was because her grandfather did not approve that she had biracial children. This to Kelly and her father, David, they both knew that this was not the case. And David would end up hiring someone to look at his will. David would hire a handwriting specialist and would find that there were only 17 similarities in the signature on the will versus the 25 similarities that should have been there. So David and Kelly strongly felt that that will was forged by someone in order to cut Kelly out of the land. They would end up settling and David would get 148 acres of land. So let me do a brief timeline for you. 2001, David's dad dies. The property is split between eight grown children, left Kelly out. So David went to fight with his family in court over that. That was settled. He got 148 acres. 2005, we know that he had the trailer up and he was living on the land. In 2008, he opens his store. His store is an LLC, meaning that there are four people that technically own the store. He has two friends on the LLC and he has Mackie. Keep that in mind. In 2009, this gun range idea comes up from chapter eight. He begins to build his business. Those 1,000 yard shooting ranges that he wants to put up is a huge selling point for his business. But David, around 2011 into 2012, thinks he may want to put trailers up on the back end of his property. The back end of his property bumps right up against where that business is. So in turn, if Chapter 8 wanted to put those 1,000 yard gun ranges up, he would not be able to do so in a way that he wanted. If David would put these trailers up, it would interfere in how to lay out the gun ranges and it interfered with that selling point, that 1,000 yard range or ranges that he is trying to promote. In 2011, Peacemaker National Training Center would open. Throughout this time, there's a dispute happening between 
chapter eight in David. You know, David's business, he not only sells things at his store, but he's also buying and trading. He's making connections in the community. So it gets around pretty quick that there's this feud between David and chapter eight. And many have speculated that it was over that back piece of property for that land. I don't know if chapter eight wanted to buy it or if he wanted it given to him, but it seemed like that was the source, or at least that's what everybody was saying. At the end of 2011 into 2012, David decides he wants to move to Mississippi. He starts to put that plan in action and he puts out some sort of ad announcing that his land was for sale. Only a few days later, on January 6, 2012, David and Mackie were killed. After their murders, Chapter 8 basically takes over the land as if it's his. He demolishes the trailer within a few months. He's tearing up the property for these tough mutters in order to get business and in order to promote his gun range. Again, when these tough mutters are going on, he's making a lot of connections. In 2014 into 2015, Kelly was fighting for the land and it was hers. It was officially labeled as hers. And she allowed to have that back piece of property that he wanted. He bought that off of her. So in 2015, after this land has been sold to Chapter 8, his business, Peacemaker National Training Center, this gun range has 800 acres of land for these ranges. So we know the gun range officially opened in 2011, but the idea was there in 2009. So in 2009, Chapter 8 is hitting the pavement, making his connections, and building his business up. It did not take long at all for Peacemaker National Training Center to be a very huge part of the community and bringing an income as well as just a huge business in that area in general. They are offering memberships or day passes to any civilian. Anyone can come in and train, uh, get certification, or just recreationally shoot guns. It gets to the point where there are articles and very popular gun magazines that are boasting about Peacemaker, calling it the most elite gun range on the East Coast, one of the most diverse ranges. This place also brings a lot of military personnel. And remember, Chapter 8 was in the military, so he already has a connection there. It begins to bring in police and those who have careers in security. SWAT teams are trained there. It gets to the point where the community names it the police playground. At 2016, they have sponsors. They have 17 gun ranges, two buildings for classes and certifications, and a source tells me that they have given certifications to people from as far away as D.C. D.C. is a two-hour drive to Peacemaker. And in addition to that, the source tells me that these people in security that are training have high enough clearance to protect the president. They're holding conferences. They're holding NRA competitions. They are responsible for a huge economic boost in Berkeley County, which means businesses connect with them, politicians connect with them. So what kind of connections do you have to have in order to know that you can train police personnel, West Virginia State Police, Virginia State Police, uh, DC, Maryland, all these officials that are hired by the state and then get paid by the state to give these trainings? Who do you have to know to put that in place? Right here is a comment from someone who works for the company that bought Peacemaker. They basically state here that they use it as a training facility, uniformed officers for State Department. They believe that the company is greedy and doesn't really give a shit about making customers happy because the State Department pays for pretty much everything. Here's someone who works for a lot security company and they state that their guys go there to train and that they pay anywhere from $300 to $550 per guard 
since we're government contractors, I don't know if that's $300 to 550 per guard per training or for guard per day. But I just found that interesting. I don't know what the income was from year to year, but I can tell you right now, it's reported that Peacemaker makes $2.5 million annually right now. All these connections are being made and it just continued. So this business just started and grew and grew. So in 2018, the tides kind of begin to turn away from Chapter 8's favor. We have a change.org petition that began June 1st, 2018. Now there are 548 signatures on here, and I'm going to read a portion of this to you. It is the opinion of many in the shooting sports that Chapter 8 does not represent the values that the NRA stands for and expects of its members, boards, directors, and executives. He is the owner and founder of Peacemaker National Training Center in Glengarry, West Virginia, which appears to be a clear conflict of interest as he is in a position to potentially further his own personal interests over those of the NRA. Through dealings with other local ranges, he has alienated a great many competitive shooters in the West Virginia, Virginia, Maryland, and PA region who no longer care to associate with Peacemaker and Chapter 8. Now, I tried very hard to get in contact with the person, Jeff, here that started this petition. And I also tried to get a hold of some of the commenters as well. And I basically did not get a response or the one response that I got, the guy was just an asshole to me. So I don't know the full details of that, but it's, it seems like things are turning and people are starting to recognize the type of person, the character of this guy, and they're seeing his greed and they're pointing out conflict of interests. What I can tell you is that by 2023, Chapter 8 has moved eight hours away. The gun range was sold. That property was in the family, the Hutzler family, for over 200 years. And he sold that. I have a source that tells me, although he sold, he is still getting a small profit from every training that Peacemaker holds. So we know where the threats are coming from to David before his death. So now let's talk about the threats that come after David's death to his friends. David's friend, Annie, who we've heard from before, was reading the newspapers, gathering information from there, and it just, nothing was making sense to her, and she knew that something was wrong. David's best friend, Jim, who unfortunately has passed away since, also knew that there was something very wrong. So a few months after things seemed to settle down and it was ruled a murder-suicide and no one was really talking about it, both Annie and Jim would start digging into the case. They would talk to people, they would ask questions, and it wasn't soon after that that they began receiving threats. But here's the thing that makes it complicated. They weren't only receiving threats after looking into this case, they were receiving threats from Rusa as well. Both of them had been a part of Rusa at some point, turned their back on Rusa, and after that, they begin receiving threats. But now, on top of that, they're receiving threats from an unknown source, and Annie tells us that the basic message was, stop digging, stop what you're doing, you're in danger. This was not a murder-suicide. Yeah. No, there was absolutely zero, zero possibility that he would have done anything like yeah. this. Zero possibility. And then when I read the news articles, I'm like, this doesn't even make sense. After I talked to a detective or investigator, I waited some time, probably maybe about a 
five or six months, maybe if that. And I started digging myself. I was digging and talking to various people, trying to get records of things. The more I dug, I ended up with threats from unknown sources. I don't know who the sources were, but I was getting phone calls. I was getting uh, emails that were like, I don't even know where they came from. When I would try to have somebody trace emails, it like led to a dead end. You know, I don't know who put the threats toward me. But I do know that at one point I did have somebody show up on my property. It wasn't pleasant. And I actually had to back away from everything that I was doing at the time. Couldn't risk anything happening. And that's when I left Mississippi. And I did it under the table. I had to drop everything. My friend Jim. I know that. He tried looking into things, too. He was looking into what happened with David and Maggie, too, as well as with Rusa for a little bit to where he got to the point he wouldn't even leave his house. He sat in his recliner with a pistol in his hand at all times. Jim was terrified. That's how bad the threats got on him. I know that much. So here you have threats that are getting so bad that someone shows up on Annie's property and she feels forced to move. She moves out of state. And then threats on Jim are so bad that he's sitting at his home with a pistol at all times. Now we don't know exactly who the threats came from. We know that Rusa did threaten the both of them. But we also know that after they started digging into what happened to David and Mackie, that's when those threats escalated. Where did they come from? So when it comes to the theories, just make sure you do your own research. I obviously am gonna have an opinion on it, but you should always do your own research to form your own opinion. Now, with that being said, let's get into some of the theories. I think we need to knock out some of the ones that are just very, very highly unlikely first. The fact that this was a burglary gone wrong, that in itself just wouldn't make sense because even if it had gone wrong, they would still have had time to get the eight grand that was in David's pocket, grab some of the firearms. And if it was a burglary gone wrong, Unless there was an accelerant in the trailer, they would have had to bring accelerant along. Another reason why that would be really odd is because it was in the morning and, you know, you typically want to be covered by nighttime, um, the darkness. There were so many cars in the driveway that it would not make sense that someone would think that no one was home. Some of you may remember that I spoke to the first firefighter that was on scene a while back, Travis, and one of the things that he said, actually the first thing that he said, is that when he came to the Hutzler's home, the first thing that he noticed was the amount of cars that there were in the driveway and expected, because there were so many vehicles, that there were going to be people inside. So you run the risk of that business being right beside David's home. You run the risk of David possibly coming out and walking over to open it. You run the risk of people coming in as customers. You run the risk of another employee pulling up. Also with the timing, you would almost, you would almost have to know the timing of the bus because that bus comes through so many times a day and it parks on David's land so many times a day throughout the day that it would just be really, really lucky to have been able to do this so fast um, and a, I believe uh, it happened, the bus driver left at 8.15 and by 8.26 there was a phone call made. So someone would have to get so lucky to have been able to do that while the bus was not there, set the home on fire and then get out. I just, that alone makes me think that this was not something that was random, um, that this was something that was done because it was personal and it was done knowing the routines of David and Mackie and the store and the bus. 
Again, uh, we don't know for sure if there was video footage. Kelly was told once that there was video footage, then was told later that there wasn't video footage. Uh, but supposedly the first thing that she was told was that it was cut. If that's the case, you would definitely have to know that he had cameras. And another really big aspect of this case is that if he would be robbed, why wouldn't his store be robbed? I would think that that would be a target as well. But yeah, the idea of just it being a burglary to me, we can, I feel like we can throw that out the window. So there was that theory that Kelly was involved and she had two men with dreadlocks go and perform this hit because she wanted the property. To me, we can completely throw this out the window as well because for the most part, she's been the only one that has been pushing for answers in this and really wants justice. It would make no sense for her to continue to be the only one pushing if she had something involved with this. She didn't even go after the property until a couple years later. She had no idea that she had rights to it, so she just left it alone. There are even other properties that still to this day she has not claimed. She's been more focused on getting justice for her dad and her little brother. David's friend Adam said that Brand told him that there were sightings of two black men with dreads around the time this happened. Now remember, part of the reason that was given as far as why Kelly didn't get anything in the will is because her children were biracial. The race issue came from the family. It's the second time that race is being brought into this. The fact that Kelly does have black friends. And this came from Detective Brand. So where did Brand get this idea? Did he get it from the family? Did that come from Chapter 8? I haven't heard that from anyone else. And I haven't seen any evidence at all whatsoever that this theory would be supported. I was actually able to get a hold of the person that Detective Brand claimed made this statement and this person, this neighbor, said that that statement never came from his mouth. So let's talk about the potential that Rusa, someone in Rusa, committed these murders. So the motive there with Rusa would have been revenge. David was putting out all these comments and all these things about Rusa and that David was posting things that he said puts his life in danger. We know that he was receiving threats from Rusa. There's no doubt about that. Just like with the burglary theory, they would have to know the schedule. They would have to know the schedule of that bus. They would have to know the video camera was there in order to pull this off when they did. So when we talk about Timothy Turner, we know that Timothy Turner is the president of Rusa and that David had separated himself from this group. We don't know exactly when, but it was somewhat close to the time that he was killed. We know that Timothy Turner has a rather long rap sheet of basically trying to defraud the government. He's been charged and convicted of many of these types of crimes, and it just seems like that is his focus, money and greed. He doesn't have any type of violent charges or convictions in his history, not that I could find anyway. Um, now, that doesn't mean that there aren't others in the group that wouldn't have somehow harmed David or be willing to harm David. I feel like with that group being so invested in defrauding the government, you know, this is a form of greed. So I find it really hard to believe that if it was Rusa, why wouldn't things be have been taken? Um, it doesn't make any sense to me because I would think that they would take that eight grand or some guns, definitely. It just doesn't make sense to me for them to take that chance, be as greedy as they are and not take anything from the property. I think another issue with it potentially being Rusa is the fact that Jim and Annie, David's friends, were also both threatened, but nothing ever happened to them. Uh, Jim was David's best friend for a very long time. He and Annie were both in this group and both exposing them in their own way and neither one of them were harmed. In addition, I don't understand why they would kill Mackie. The only thing that I could think of is if Mackie perhaps was able to get a gun in the scuffle that happened and he was able to get a gun that was loaded and that is why he was shot. I can't imagine why they would shoot a nine-year-old boy for any other reason. And to be honest, you wouldn't even have to shoot him 
if he had a gun anyway, you could just simply take it from him. So it doesn't make sense for Rusa to kill a nine-year-old boy. Why would he need to be dead? He wouldn't be able to identify anyone. He doesn't know anybody in Rusa. So why take out a nine-year-old boy? And the thing that I just keep coming back to is the fact that Annie overheard two conversations, two arguments with David and his nephew. And it was very, very obvious that his nephew made David very nervous, very anxious. And he was getting ready to leave. Like he wanted to leave to Mississippi. But the only one he ever stressed any kind of fear was towards his nephew. I knew it was his nephew because I remember him stating that specifically. And he didn't say nephew, uh, he only said nephew. I've yet to find anyone that can confirm that he was actually worried about the threats that Russo was putting on him. I don't, I don't know. I don't think it's a very strong, I don't think he would have a very strong case against Russo at all. I just don't. Now we come to the idea that David's nephew, Mackie's cousin, did this or had something to do with it. The motive would have been that back piece of property, David's land. So before I go any further, I want to go ahead and make some things very clear and set some boundaries. You guys know I have not been using people's names for the most part, but I know that Google searches and some very smart web sleuths are going to be able to find out who I'm speaking to in the majority of these cases. And also I know that people in the area are going to know who I'm speaking of. It is imperative that no one reaches out to anyone involved in any of these videos that I've created, unless you're reaching out to myself or to Kelly Hutzler. Everyone deserves a privacy and no one deserves to be harassed. And that's only going to impede and hinder the investigation. That's the last thing that we are trying to do in this case. Everyone is innocent until proven guilty. And I want to make it very clear right now that chapter eight has never been officially named a suspect. Now, I know that Kelly says that he was at some point that Maynard did tell Kelly that he was a suspect. However, under oath, Maynard said that he did not call him a suspect. So we have to go with that bit of information. Just want to make it very clear, there have never been any charges in this case. And Chapter 8 has not ever officially been listed a suspect. Additionally, the Gun Range Peacemaker National Training Center is now owned and operated by a different company and should also be left out of this. This is just a theory, so take it with a grain of salt, form your own opinion, and with that being said, let's get into this. So I found this video on Peacemaker that looks like it was kind of like the introduction to what Peacemaker is. Check this out. Located in Glengarry, West Virginia, our ranges are modern, built to world-class standards, and include technology that you won't find elsewhere. Our ranges include the nation's only 1,000-yard electronic rifle range. In 2009, Chapter 8 has this idea to build these gun ranges, and the 1,000-yard shooting ranges were at the top of his list. Chapter 8 wants that land. Now, he has over a 1,000 acres. So why he could not use his own property for that, we don't know. But it is pretty much well known around the area that this was the argument. I mean, think about it. David owns that store. So not only are people going to hear things, they're also possibly going to see things because David owns that store and he lives right beside it. So these are the type of things that are getting around. So if the motive is the property and the arguments are over that, the day that the ad was put in the paper that David was selling that land would have shot chapter eight through the roof in anger. If that was, if it was truly the property, that was the motive. 
he could have just lost it, lost control. So from the very beginning, this back piece of property that David owned was the center of attention. If you go all the way back to when David's dad died and think about the fact that that will was likely forged, chapter eight did not ever intend on anyone disputing that. He didn't intend or plan for David to get that 148 acres. So then there's this issue of if he puts trailers up on the back end of his property, chapter eight's business is affected. We have Annie telling us that after the last big argument between David and his nephew, that is when David no longer talked about putting trailers up on his land anymore and switched his plan to moving to Mississippi. It wasn't until the last, well, since when the threats got real bad, that last one, like I said, the one where he was whispering, I quiet, but she felt it. That was the last time I heard anything about that. So by his own admission, and it is documented in a newspaper article, Chapter 8 saw David a few days before David and Mackie were killed. He makes the bizarre statement that David was really happy that day. And why is why would David ever be happy around him considering their feud? What if this day was the ultimatum? What if this is the day chapter eight sees or hears about that land being sold and decides he's going to give it one more try to talk to David? And if it didn't go the way he liked, his mind was made up. He was going to get that land one way or another. And then before David can sell the land, he ends up dead along with Mackie, taking two people out on the LLC of David's shop. He is able to get those two friends off the LLC. Chapter 8 does not plan on Kelly coming back. Chapter 8 takes over the land as if it's his. But when Kelly comes back and she fights it and that property is officially hers, when she tries to sell it, her for sale signs get ripped down. The first time I've ever met with Chapter, uh, you know, the first thing he said to me was, oh, Kelly, I know your dad was never a good daddy. I'm like, who the hell says that to someone that just lost their dad? And, uh, you know, the first at the second thing he says is how, listen, there's this back piece of property. You know, and uh, your, uh, you know, I was talking to your dad about buying it. Wasn't planning on my daddy getting that land. He wasn't prepared for daddy to move there. He was going to take all that property. But daddy intervened. So that was always the back piece of property that was concerned about. Chapter 8 immediately wants to buy the back half. And he eventually does. So the likelihood of this being the tension between he and David is pretty high, likely more than just a rumor. Something from the beginning that I've just always been hung up on is the time of day, the time and the date that this happened. This was a Friday at eight in the morning. Why would you do that in a morning to begin with? Because usually people like the cover of darkness. Again, you run into the same risks at the store, the possibility of customers, the possibility of David going out to open the store, the possibility of an employee pulling up. You would have to know the store hours. You would have to know when that business was open. It's riskier to do that in the morning. And with how the bus comes and goes, remember the bus driver said that he sits on that property five, six times a day in between his routes. And he goes back and forth and then to Davis property and back and forth. So the chance of him hearing or seeing something is pretty likely. Now we know that he didn't, but that's a risk that someone would have to take. So why Friday at 8 a.m.? Now, Mackie had an extended vacation with David. He was staying a little bit longer through the holidays that he normally would. David and Mackie's mom share custody. Was Mackie due back in his mother's care for that weekend? 
Did Mackie have to be there? Was Mackie also a target? Was he an intentional target? Or was it just a simple fact Would someone that have been comfortable Mackie enough to identify use whoever did this? Maker's land to hide. It's or, just the 8 a.m. on a Friday. What that about chapter really, eight? Chapter eight something about would that be expected to, to be on Peacemaker's what land. What if a certain that detective time? had to be on duty? He had a glancing gunshot on his chin, so he was fighting for his life before he got shot in the head. They were both found in the bed, laying side by side. Unless David actually fell on that bed, I find it a little hard to believe that one person would be able to move him from the floor to the bed. He was about 5'10 and around 180 pounds. You think of that in terms of dead weight, that's really heavy. And then I go back to what David's friend Adam told me that Detective Brand had told him that there was a safe in the bedroom that was open and nothing was in it. Can't help but wonder if there was a gun in there. And at some point, David or Mackie was able to get that gun and they started fighting. If that's the case, you're not only looking for the murder weapon that killed David, but you're also looking for David's gun because if it wasn't found there, if it wasn't one of those 58 firearms, where did it go? So then with the open lockbox, you also have the possibility that it was just open because maybe David had just taken that eight grand out. Um, we know he had that in his pocket. My assumptions are because he was going to get some sort of, sort of money order to give to Annie. Um, in order to go ahead and put his plan of moving to Mississippi in action. So it could have simply just been open because of that. But when someone has 58 firearms, I find it hard to believe that they wouldn't have one loaded in their bedroom and possibly in a lockbox. We'll come back to this here in a little bit. I want to go over the crime scene a little bit further first. Now, if you look at the land, you know that David's land and Peacemaker land are back to back. When you think in terms of executing this, where could you hide? In that very small driveway that was across from David's land, honestly, it looks like there's minimal coverage. So the chance of that being used to hide out seems unlikely to me. But they would have to hide out somewhere to make sure that they saw when the bus leaves because as soon as that bus leaves they would have to take action they would have to move and get this done because they know the bus is going to come back through in about 10 minutes where could you hide where could you park your vehicle or where you just dropped off now remember there was that black truck that at some point the investigators were searching for if there was a black truck where did it park would someone have been comfortable enough to park on Peacemaker land, not expecting to be caught? Did they take that risk? Chapter 8's vehicle would already be expected to be at the gun range. If he was involved, he could have whoever did this park at the gun range. It would have been pretty easy if someone was hiding right beside the land on Peacemaker property, waiting to kill these two. There's just so little coverage here. Where were they? So whoever did this likely came in the back door. Their home was fairly close to the road and that road is very busy, especially in the morning at rush hour. So to avoid being seen, they would have come in the back door. We know that the Christmas tree in David's home was knocked over. So there was some sort of scuffle Rather, they knocked on the door, waited till it was open and bombarded them, or just walked in and attacked him. There was a scuffle there. We also know that Mackie fought. He had a glancing gunshot on his chin, so he was fighting for his life before he got shot in the head. They were both found in the bed, laying side by side. Unless David actually fell on that bed, I find it a little difficult hard to believe that one person would be able to move him from the floor to the bed. He was about 5'10 and around 180 pounds. You think of that in terms of dead weight, that's really heavy. And then I go back to what David's friend Adam told me that Detective Brand had told him 
that there was a safe in the bedroom that was open and nothing was in it. Can't help but wonder if there was a gun in there. And at some point, David or Mackie was able to get that gun and they started fighting. If that's the case, you're not only looking for the murder weapon that killed David, but you're also looking for David's gun because if it wasn't found there, if it wasn't one of those 58 firearms, where did it go? So then with the open lockbox, you also have the possibility that it was just open because maybe David had just taken that eight grand out. Um, we know he had that in his pocket. My assumptions are because he was going to get some sort of, sort of money order to give to Annie um, in order to go ahead and put his plan of moving to Mississippi in action. So it could have simply just been open because of that. But when someone has 58 firearms, I find it hard to believe that they wouldn't have one loaded in their bedroom and possibly in a lockbox. We'll come back to this here in a little bit. I want to go over the crime scene a little bit further first. We know that the specialized dogs hit on four places where accelerants were used. So likely whoever did this, they brought in accelerants. They brought in gasoline or kerosene or something of that nature. Most likely, since the bodies were charred, accelerants were put on both David and Mackie. Now, Kelly said that fire was completely contained to the bedroom, so all the accelerant was used there. Those accelerants were likely brought to the scene, indicating that this was all planned out. However, did it go as planned? Now, do you remember in the last video, I said that Kelly continues to say, we need to go back to the beginning in order to solve these homicides. I want to go back to Trooper Brand. We know his morals were fucked up just by the simple fact that he was getting paid from the National Guard when he was not working for the National Guard while he was a police officer. So convicted of fraud, pled guilty. That says something about a person's character. Is there a connection between Chapter 8 and Brand back in 2012? And there are a few reasons why this would make sense. Trooper Brand would be the one assigned originally to this case, and he's the youngest detective. Again, only four murders in Berkeley County in 2011 and in 2012. They give a homicide of a nine-year-old boy and his father to a young detective who obviously is not trained in any sort of way to handle this case. Or was Brand not really that incompetent? Was he being told from the top to label this as a murder-suicide to begin with? Did someone in that police department know that he was dirty? Did someone in that police department use him? Did they know that he was committing fraud and was about to be fired anyway and just saw him as a lost cause and directed him to guide this investigation into a murder-suicide. Remember the PI that worked for Kelly? He said that he got stopped right at the top. After the superintendent, he couldn't do anything else. He was stuck. We already know that he had senior officials telling him in the beginning that this was double homicide and he went against that. You know, we know that he, he didn't take part in the autopsy. We know that there were only four pages in the files. We know that there's a serious issue here. Let me tell you what else happened. There were 58 firearms that David owned that were in that trailer. Trooper Brand would give 54 of those firearms directly to Chapter 8. Passing this amount of firearms right along to someone else, to the nephew, where is your right to do that? And I'm guessing that you can figure out who also ended up with that eight grand. Kelly met with chapter eight here and there. At first, she wasn't sure about him, but it didn't take too long for her to have her suspicions. The second meeting, Kelly tells us that the $8,000 is in a bag. It's handed to her. Chapter eight says he conveniently bumped into brand. Think about that. 
So if you conveniently bump into Brand, then Brand conveniently must have had $8,000, which was evidence, in his pocket, on his person. What? What sense does that make? And she knew that eight grand was most definitely from the fire. It smelled like fire. Again, what gives you the right? He explained to me that they found 58 firearms the day of the incident. And um, he told me the group of brands, four of the firearms, and released 54 firearms to him. Trooper Brand knew Chapter 8. Chapter 8 gave me nearly $8,000 that was in my daddy's pocket. He told me I conveniently bumped into Brand. That's exactly what he told me. He brought me, he pulled out a plastic baggie. Uh, the money, it, it smelled horrible. It was, it was still wet. I don't know where he had had it. And that that little bit of time, but it was still soaking wet, it smelled as fire, and he explained to me that that was in my daddy's pocket, and that it was it was to come to me. So, then why wasn't everything else supposed to come to me? Right, and how did he get and it to begin the, with? Don't inquiry minds want to know. Well, the fact that it was given to you while there was still an investigation going, that's correct, right? Right. That shouldn't have been done just because the investigation was still open. So what is the likelihood that this type of thing would happen, these exchanges, without there being a prior relationship amongst the two to begin with? So with Brand just handing over these 54 firearms to Chapter 8, it creates this confusion. What if there was a gun of David's that was missing? What if there were two murder weapons and one of them was David's gun? Now you have this undocumented trail of firearms just being dispersed. Was that intentional to create chaos? Were ballistics done comparing the bullet in David to the bullet in Mackie? You know, if there's two different types of bullets, that supports the idea that there are two guns. There were likely two people there. We don't know if ballistics were done. And seeing that 54 or 58 firearms were given to Chapter 8, my guess is... There was never a comparison to the guns that David had registered to what was in the trailer to see if one would have been missing. With this being labeled as a murder-suicide only weeks after this happened, Chapter 8 was able to demolish that trailer, that trailer that is evidence, because he's basically claimed over it anyway, and he's got the green light because they don't see it as evidence. They see this as case closed. That's convenient. It's also very convenient that it wasn't just David who died. It was Mackie who was taken, who was also on the LLC for David's shop. That's convenient. It's convenient for Chapter 8. We, there's no denying that. It's also convenient that Kelly isn't in town and she is trying to handle things from New Jersey and doesn't know the law and how it would work to where she would actually have rights to the land. She wouldn't find that out until later. That's convenient for him. Can't no one tell me that this isn't a cover up? Because when Trooper Maynard brought me in, tell me that you was made to call Chapter 8 and you had told this higher power that you wasn't obligated to call Chapter 8 back due to the fact that he hadn't been ruled out as a suspect. The Trooper Maynard was made to call Chapter 8 and when he called him, guess what he wanted? He wanted, the, if he could help him locate the other two gentlemen off of the LLCs of the property. So somehow he accomplished that, but he didn't accomplish that after Trooper Maynard. So see if you knock them two off, and then yeah, I guess you paid them. I don't know. <laughs> what did he say? How did he get them off of the property? I that that's a piece of the puzzle that I can never get. And the trooper man had explained to me. He says, Kelly, I want you to know that Chapter Eight has a higher power in him. I can't tell you who. I can't tell you how. 
and they're moving. When he told me that, I never thought that that meant that I would never speak to him again. So Sergeant Maynard is not answering Chapter 8's phone calls. He has not officially labeled him as a suspect, according to his statement under oath. But he is considering that that may happen in the future. So he does not want to talk to Chapter 8 right now. He is not prepared to do that. However, Chapter 8 gets a hold of someone in that police department with some power. And that someone then tells Maynard it's not an option to ignore his phone calls that he must talk to chapter eight. And when he does, what he would want would have nothing to do with solving these murders. He doesn't wanna know anything about the case. He's not interested in who potentially may have killed two people in his family, including a nine-year-old boy, nine-year-old cousin. He doesn't ask how the case is going, if it's moving along doesn't offer any assistance, but he simply wants to know if Maynard will help him find the other two people that were listed on the LLC, the two people remaining. So again, just something else relating to the property. But it's funny that right after Maynard explains that chapter eight may be a suspect, and he says this to someone higher up, boom, he's moved. So if there's a connection there, if there's some sort of relationship there between someone higher up in that department and that police department and Chapter 8, who else does Chapter 8 know that has the ability and is dirty enough to impact this investigation? Is that how Kelly's files at the governor's office were deleted three times? Is that why the PI couldn't get any further in his investigation? Would he know anyone that would make evidence disappear? Or would he have the connections to find the information for Jim and Annie and send someone all the way to Mississippi to land on Annie's property and threaten her to stop the investigation that she's doing? Does he have connections that's stopping the newspaper from printing out anything about this case to get it moving forward. Is it possible that he has a hand in every single thing that has went wrong with this case? Again, chapter eight has just dug his teeth, sunk his claws into Berkeley County. How deep do these connections go and what will some of these connections do for a dollar? Money was obviously an issue here because Chapter 8 lost an entire year, 2015, those Tough mutters. He lost those events, money for those events. He was already broke because of the $1 million tax imposed when David's dad died. Where is his money going to come from? Supposedly, this is a $1 million project. Who invested? Who did he borrow money from? Who did he owe? Was there anyone listed on the LLC as a private owner? Did he have to share ownership in order to make this happen? Was there someone else listed on the LLC as a private owner? If so, who? Any of those connections possibly? We've seen earlier that chapter eight has no problem with conflict of interests. So who else does he know and what else will they do? So then we have the other piece to this. Was Mackie supposed to be there? We don't know if chapter eight knew Mackie was on the LLC. After all, he did call Detective Maynard to get information about people on the LLC. Now, did that mean he didn't know who was on the LLC or did that mean that he needed help getting in contact with them? We don't know. But let's say he didn't know Mackie was on the LLC and this, and, and he just wasn't supposed to be there. I think that's a possibility. And when this happened, 
rather chapter eight did it himself or rather he had someone else do it for him. Maybe Mackie being there just threw everything off, off track. You know, if you wanted David dead, you could easily make this look like a burglary, right? But of course you would have to then take things, which didn't happen. But you wouldn't use burglary as an excuse if you wanted those firearms because you're going to be connected to the case if you end up with these firearms. Unless you have a detective that gives them to you. So then why wasn't the Rusa angle taken? Because... You know, you have to understand people were at David's home and at David's store all the time. It was very well known that he was a sovereign citizen. I don't think it is out of reach to say that most people would know Rusa was giving David trouble. So why wouldn't you use that angle and blame it on Rusa? I just think that that idea supports my thought and this being planned so fast. Certain attention to detail just did not happen. That ad went in the paper trying to sell the land. David's trying to move. David has to be stopped. So if you rule out burglary and you don't take the Rusa angle, then suicide would be left. But you would definitely leave the gun. For what reason would David set fires? We all know fires destroy DNA, and that was likely the reason why it was set, but if it was suicide, why would David set fires? So maybe this was supposed to be a suicide, but the fact that Mackie was there, it totally threw everything off. And last minute, they had to decide to make it look like a murder-suicide. But then again, why wasn't the weapon left there? I think the fact that the murder weapon was not left there is key. There is something about that piece that answers questions for us. And I still have questions as to whether or not the bullet in Mackie was the same as the bullet in David. I have questions if there were two guns, if there were two people or more. What if this originally was planned to look like a suicide, but Mackie was there and it threw everything off and hasty decisions were made. Attention to detail wasn't there and the gun did not get left there. That's obviously leaving questions. But if you know a detective or you know a superintendent who can sway this case as a murder-suicide, does it really matter? You know, I think at this point, motives stack very high against Chapter 8. And I'd be curious to know if you guys think that the circumstantial evidence is enough to bring him into question. You know, with cold cases, time can be on your side in a way that people's relationships change. Maybe guilt gets to them. But time can also be a bitch in these cases. We've lost the opportunity to interview some of these people. We've lost the opportunity to interview Jim, David's best friend. And we lost the opportunity to talk to Detective Corey Maynard about what he knew. Those opportunities are gone now. Time is not on our side in that essence. So how long are we going to wait to bring forth these questions to the people who need to provide these answers? So much time has passed that a dead man was given as the murderer. John, remember, he emailed me saying that this case was essentially closed slash solved on his end. Well, we have to talk about the person that he handed over, the dead person that he claims is the sole murderer. And this case, this case may have slowed down, but it is not at an end. Just recently, there has been someone who has told Detective Nine that he was there the day that David and Mackie were murdered. He was there for the whole crime. Now this guy, he is a shady son of a bitch. And what he has to say is going to be questionable. But we have to listen to that information to see if there is anything in there that tells the full story. You know, some of these people who are involved have kids now. And I can't 
I can't help but think if as their kids get older, every birthday, do they think of Mackie? Because Mackie, it was, he was cut short. He could, he didn't even reach the age of 10. So do these people 11 and a half years later, do they have any sense of remorse at all? Is he the last thing that they see before they close their eyes at night? Or do they not think about this ever? Regardless of if he was supposed to be there or not, his life was taken. Probably in one of the worst ways ever. He lied beside his father. He watched his father get shot. He had soot in his lungs. So he was alive as he and his father burned. Can you imagine the terror that that child felt before he died? Again, guys, contact information is listed below. You can remain completely anonymous. That's perfectly fine. That's happened. I have had people who have contacted me that you don't know about because I am keeping that private. I stick to my word. And before we come to an end, I want you to check out these cases that are local to Berkeley County. These are more unsolved cases that need answers. These are more families that need help. On September 4th, 2018, Mike Kilmer Jr., who was riding a motorcycle, was hit and killed in the crash at the intersection of Edwin Miller Boulevard and Warm Springs Avenue. Please take a look at this photo. This photo is a picture of a man that was seen leaving the area in a Ford F-150 with a blue and gray two-toned paint scheme. The truck is described as having four doors, a diamond plate toolbox in the bed, and a chrome push front bumper guard. These are very good details that set a vehicle apart. Do you know anyone who drives a vehicle like this? On January 3rd, 2022, the Berkeley County Sheriff's Office shared this photo of these two women who may have information on this case. These potential witnesses are not in any legal trouble and are simply needed to aid in this renewed investigation. Were you there on the day and do you have information? Do you know anyone who looks like this? The Sheriff's Office is looking for your help. There's a potential $5,000 reward in this case. So again, please take a very, very good look at this photo. Call the Berkeley County Sheriff's Department at 304-267-7000 for tips, or you can stay anonymous by calling the Berkeley County Crime Stoppers at 304-267-4999. Linda Emerson, who also could go under Linda Emerson Wisenant, has been missing from the Great Capen area of West Virginia since April of 2021. She is currently 53, approximately 5'6 and 165 pounds, she has brown eyes and usually a brown or dark reddish hair. She has several ear piercings, a tattoo of an imp on one of her calves and a tree frog. Jordan Lee is tattooed on her wrist. She has Hashimoto's disease and possibly lupus. She does not drive. She has connections to both Virginia and New Jersey. The last known whereabouts is out of Great Capen in Morgan County, West Virginia. Her boyfriend was questioned at their residence and stated that they had gotten into a fight. He took a nap and woke up to hearing a car door slam. Linda does not typically go this long without speaking with her family and foul play is suspected. If you have any information at all, please contact Troop 2 Sam Smith of the West Virginia State Police 304-258-0000 or contact Jen at VoicesForTheSilenced.org. In the next video, we're going to explore the idea of a potential murder for hire and analyze the person that Detective Nine 
is giving as the murder. Been able to speak to another friend of David and Mackie's. And I'm going to tell you about that. And I also had the opportunity to go to the prosecutor's office with Kelly to discuss this case and the status. All of that will be discussed in video four. In the meantime, support the Facebook group by joining. Please sign the petition to get the feds involved in this case. And if you are able to donate just $5 to the GoFundMe, that is also listed below. Any and every single thing that you do that can help, we appreciate. Okay, guys. So again, thank you so much for sticking with me on this and on this case. It means so much. Please like and subscribe. It helps so much in getting this video out there. So get this video in front of as many people as you can, please, for David and Mackie and for Kelly Hutzler. Until then, guys, have a great day and go out there. Don't be afraid to raise some hell. See you later.